Sunshine Cathedral is a different kind of church where the past is past and the future has infinite possibilities. This is the day our God has made. I'm reading this morning from the Gospel according to Mark. When Jesus had crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd had gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came. And when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. In these human words, God's voice is heard. The story continues. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet, instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touch his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you? His disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him, the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. In these human words, God's voice is heard. Please rise as you're able for our next reading. of the story. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him, and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, 
which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. In these human words, God's voice is heard. Thanks be to God. God. We join now in a spirit of prayer. Heal our fears and give us the grace to live joyfully and abundantly. Holy God. Amen. Join me in the spirit of prayer. Let us dwell together in peace. And let us not be instruments of our own or others' oppression. And now may God's word be spoken. May only God's word be heard. Amen. Amen. It's another long gospel reading. You know I love those. Because when things are really packed like that, we have to unpack. And I, I love doing that bit of unpacking. And storytelling at home with the suitcase and the clothes and moving away, not so much. But with storytelling, I love the, uh, the unpacking. In our gospel reading today, someone approaches Jesus to say that a child's in trouble. The uh, a synagogue leader, uh, his kid is very ill. And just like that, Jesus hears about it 
and just decides he'll go visit her. I'll go, let's go. He just heard that a child was hurting and his response was immediately to show compassion. He didn't ask what her religion was. He didn't ask if she had one parent or two or if they'd been married in a religious setting or what their genders were or if she'd had the, the appropriate rituals when she was a child that his religion uh, dictated. He didn't ask any questions at all. Oh, someone's hurting. Let me go see about them. Let me go visit. No questions asked. No judgments. No assumptions. Just let me go ask. We often forget. Sometimes we'll hear really bitter debates. And I always love when religion gets bitter. Isn't that the point? And uh, we'll hear these bitter debates about what it is to be a person of faith, what it is to be right with God, what it is to be righteous. And there will be these traditions people insist have to be followed or these things that have to be avoided or, or these opinions one must hold. And in the long list of musts and do's and don'ts, uh, you hear so little about compassion. You hear so little about love your neighbor as yourself. You hear so little about do unto others as you would have others do unto you. There is this list of fundamentals and compassion is almost never on the list. And if we get caught in that trap, I believe we've missed the point. We've missed the plot entirely. Jesus' response wasn't to ask any theological questions. She's hurting. Let me go see her. The end. Now on his way to visit this child, he gets delayed. There's a woman who has been struggling with a gynecological issue for 12 years. When I said that word, eyes glazed over, all the air got sucked out of this part of the room, and I actually heard about a dozen butts clench in the middle here. If that one word in the 21st century can make us uncomfortable like that, imagine the stigma this woman in the first century lived with. She has been struggling with this issue for a long time. Mark says 12 years, 12. And I don't think that that necessarily has anything to do with how long she's had the issue. Who knows how long she's had the issue? Uh, what we know is that, it, that it's something that really plagues her. And that he uses 12, you know, you see 12 a lot in the Bible, and you see three, and you see 40, and you see seven, and these always tend to mean something. And uh, it's really not about the passing of time. So that she has been dealing with this for 12 years. Remember 12, there are 12 tribes of Israel. Remember that Jesus has 12 apostles, that God has gathered these people to be these tribes, that God has gathered them, and that Jesus has chosen these apostles. 12 represents God's choosing, God's gathering, that, that we are chosen. If we're in that 12, we're those 12 tribes, we're those 12 apostles. Uh, we are part of God's chosen, God's delight, God's presence, God's watching over us, God's calling us and, and putting us to work. So I believe that Mark is telling us something about this woman, not just that she's been suffering for 12 years, but that her suffering does not limit who she is. She's part of 12 somehow. She's part of God's calling, God's anointing, God's care. I believe Mark is telling us that this woman has an illness that has stigmatized her, but she is a child of God. She has sacred value, no amount of struggle and no amount of judgment from others can diminish her sacred value. Someone even still needs to hear that, that no amount of struggle and no amount of judgment from others can diminish her, your, our, my sacred value. The woman. Oh, save it up, it gets better. Don't bust the capillary, we, 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 we got more coming. The woman isn't named in the story, so let's give her a name. You know, I can't stand when, when people are unnamed. And so let's call her Elpis. I like that name. In Greek mythology, Elpis is the personification of hope. And so I think this woman, this woman who's been suffering for some time, who, who is identified by the sacred number 12, I, I believe hope is a good name for her. So she is Elpis. And our Elpis, according to Mark, has been sick for years and has seen a bunch of doctors who haven't been able to help her. 
And she has spent all of her money searching for a cure. No one should have to spend their life savings just to stay alive, but that is a whole nother sermon. She has spent all of her money just trying to be healthy. And she is desperate for a cure because apart from the discomfort of her condition, there is a stigma associated with her condition. So what she needs healing from as much as from the discomfort is from the stigma that people have placed on her. And people still place stigma on people's conditions, on their illnesses, on their troubles. There are people who are ashamed to talk about their addictions because there is stigma around being an addict. And people won't talk about their depression or their anxiety or their bipolar disorder because there is stigma around mental illness. I was talking to my psychiatrist about that just the other day. Like, there's a stigma about, about this. Why is that? And people won't, they don't want to come out about their HIV status because there is a stigma. In fact, they don't want to talk about any uh, sexually transmitted disease because there is a stigma. There is shame imposed. And so this woman has an illness, she has a condition that people stigmatize her for. Not only do they not have compassion for her discomfort, but they actually blame her for it and avoid her for it. And they do it in the name of religion. You see, Leviticus 15 says that a woman is unclean when she discharges blood. I bet a woman didn't write that passage, by the way. <laughs> Don't let me prove, but I'm just guessing that a man wrote that. So that, that she's unclean when she's discharging blood, and when she is considered unclean, anything or anybody she touches is also then considered unclean. And so Elpis is called unclean. Now come on, not just, not just sick, not just, not just unfortunate, not just a little under the weather. She is unclean, she is nasty. That's what they're saying. And in fact, so nasty she can't be touched by person or thing. If she sits in your chair, you just have to throw it out. You will, she will not be borrowing your clothes. She is literally untouchable. That's what her religion has told her. Can you imagine religion telling you that you are untouchable, unlovable, and worthless? Can you even imagine such a ridiculous scenario? And so she has been told by her society, by her neighbors, by her family, by everyone, that she is untouchable. She's nasty. She is unclean. That must hurt. I promise you it does. How lonely, how humiliating, how dehumanizing to be called untouchable. Elpis wants her symptoms relieved, of course, but she also wants to be touched. She wants to be embraced. She wants to be seen as more than an issue, more than a problem, more than a condition. But she is hopeful. Elpis is the personification of hope. She spent money until it ran out, but she didn't give up. She saw doctor after doctor, but she didn't give up. And now she's trying something new. She's even branching out into alternative medicine. She grabs Jesus' clothes. We'll call that fabric therapy. She has reached out. She has tried on fabric therapy. She can't approach him directly. But maybe. She can't because she's untouchable. They'll see her coming. They will stop her. You get away from everybody. You untouchable, unclean thing, you. So she can't just walk up and say, hi, <laughs> shake your hand, tell you my problem. But she said, maybe if I sneak up on him, maybe if I come from behind, maybe if I crouch down low and just reach out and touch a little piece of his clothes, he won't even know. But maybe because he is so kind and so loving and so compassionate, he teaches healing and hope all the time. He's empowering people all the time. There's something really great about him. Maybe if I can just touch a little piece of his clothes, some healing mojo will, will come into me. And I'll be healed and I won't be an outcast. I won't be untouchable anymore. But Jesus does notice her. See, Jesus, that's one of the things that got him in trouble. He tends to notice the unnoticed. He tends to notice the forgotten. He tends to notice the overlooked, the erased, the marginalized. Jesus notices the closeted, the caged, the banned. He notices the hurting. He notices the fearful. Jesus notices and Jesus cares. Oh, let us who dare to use the name of Jesus become at least slightly more like 
Jesus, to notice, to care, for our article of faith to be compassion. And so Jesus tells Elvis that her faith has healed her. Faith is trust. And Elpis has been trusting. Oh, she's a trusting soul. A lot of us would have given up before Elpis has. She trusted doctors to do their best, even when their best didn't seem to be good enough. Elpis trusted that after all she had done to find healing, it would be worth it to try one more thing. She trusted that as, as much of a long shot as it seemed to be, it was worth trying an alternative treatment. Hemline therapy. I'll try this one now. She trusted that after years of failure, today could be the day that things turned around. She trusted that even though yesterday was a bust, today could be different. And Elpis, Jesus says, your trust has been rewarded. Now, did her condition go away? Or did her self-loathing go away? Either way, she was healed. Did her condition improve or did she just come to know that her condition does not define her or limit her and that no matter what, she is loved by God and that love will never go away. Either way, she was healed. When I was an AIDS chaplain, this passage was very helpful to people I found who were living with AIDS. When they were told that they were untouchable, oh, in those early days, they were told they were untouchable and basically unlovable. People would say, crying. Some of their first, first thing when they were crying after the diagnosis was, who will ever love me now? How will I ever find someone now? And then they were afraid that their family would reject them. They were so closeted. They, once they find out this, they'll find out other things. And, and they just won't be able to take all that. They literally were told, or at least believed, that they were unlovable and untouchable. And this passage offered hope. This passage seemed to say, trust in your sacred value. Trust that another tri drug trial could be the breakthrough. Hope that life can be filled with joy no matter what happens. Trust that God cannot be tainted and God's love cannot be tainted or infected by a virus and that divine love will hold you throughout this condition, this situation and far beyond. Try one more thing, try one more time. Trust that HIV can also mean hope is vital. And people were healed, perhaps not cured. Many died, but in various ways, they were healed. Your pastor was among them. Now Jesus gets word. He has encouraged this woman who has believed she was untouchable and she has been healed from that lie. She now knows that to Jesus and to the God Jesus serves, no one is unlovable, no one is untouchable. She has in that way been healed and now Jesus gets word that the child he was going to visit has died. But he says, maybe not. Let's see. The child is Jairus' daughter. She isn't otherwise named, so let's give her a name. We'll call her Jerina. Name for her dad, why not? Jesus hears that Jerina is finished, but he needs to see for himself. Don't let someone tell you that you should give up your hope. Don't let someone tell you that there is nothing to be salvaged. Don't let someone tell you that there isn't something to learn or something to gain or something that can be rescued from the wreckage. Don't let someone tell you when you need to give up your hope, your dream for a better tomorrow. You'll probably never get a better yesterday, but don't let anyone take away your tomorrow. Check it out for yourself, just in case things aren't quite as bad as others have said. And so Jesus says to Jerina, get up. She looks dead. He's like, well, let's see, get up. Now, if she gets up, she wasn't dead. See, it's a, it's a simple test. <laughs> she looks dead, they say she's dead, let's see. Hey, get up, what? <laughs> I don't think she's dead. Now, was Jerina in a coma? Was she just a really sound sleeper? Who knows? The message really isn't for Jerina, at least it's not just for her. Jesus says, get up. But isn't that for any person who is paralyzed with fear or regret or defeat? Anyone who seems lifeless because they are stuck in their fears and their pain? Isn't he telling the people watching, and us for that matter, get up? Mark says that after Jesus said, get up, Jerina started walking around. Jesus said, get that girl a sandwich. Jesus isn't 
just telling her to get up. Isn't Jesus telling us all to get up and get busy? You thought it was over. You thought it was hopeless. You thought you were down for the count. You thought you were beaten, forgotten, used up. Get up. Get moving. Have something to eat. Freshen up. There is something to do and something to achieve and something to strive for and something to hope for. Get up and get to it. And also, Jerina was 12 years old. What? I think Mark's got a plan. I think he's doing this on purpose. He's making a point. Was she 12 or did she even exist for that matter? Who cares? Mark is saying again, you felt defeated. You felt lifeless. You felt hopeless, beaten, irrelevant, used up, but you're 12. You're part of the 12. 12 means God's chosen, or as we say around here, you are God's miracle and not God's mistake. So get up and get back to life. Both Elpis and Jarena are women, you'll notice. And women told us the story today, how appropriate. Women had almost no status apart from a man in that culture. Most women had very little power or influence. And yet, it is an untouchable, outcast, stigmatized woman whose faith gives her another chance at life. Jesus didn't say, oh, poor, untouchable woman, I'll have mercy on you and heal you. No, he said, you who thought you were untouchable, your own faith has done this work. You are a miracle. You, the ex miracle you are experiencing is the miracle you are. Your faith has made you well. Jesus apparently didn't do much other than remind her who she really was. And it is a young, defeated, seemingly lifeless girl who also gets another chance and is encouraged to get up and get back to living her life. To anyone in the room or on the internet, to anyone who has been demonized or dehumanized or vilified or erased, trust in your innate goodness and jump back into life. Nelson Mandela was a black man living in oppressive conditions under South African apartheid. He became an anti-apartheid revolutionary and wound up spending a quarter of a century in prison for his activism. But one day he got out. One day he got out of prison and became a democratically elected president of the country that had imprisoned him for working for justice. And as president and later as elder statesman, he worked for reconciliation, healing, and justice. He believed in goodness, and his trust in goodness changed his nation. Live in hope. Even when things look really, really bad, maybe especially when things look really, really bad, live in hope. Live in the trust that the future has infinite possibilities. Get up. Keep going. Elpis, you are a person of sacred value. Jarina, you are God's miracle and not God's mistake. Get up. Get back to living and loving your life. That's the life-giving gospel. This is the good news. Amen.